Tricia Russell is a member of the Global Risk Management Team at Bank of America, as well as the company's LGBT Pride Enterprise Leadership Council, and she has more than 30 years of varied banking experience. She's also a former successful small business owner. Her educational background includes a BA in economics and math from Kalamazoo College in Michigan and an MBA in finance from the University of Michigan. Tricia is broadly engaged both within and external to Bank of America in diversity and inclusion education and advocacy work. In addition to her active involvement as a member of the Board of Directors of Equality Florida and a member of the Transaction Florida Advisory Board of Equality Florida, Tricia is broadly engaged in various advocacy efforts in Northeast Florida, where she resides in St. Augustine. These include serving as a member of the steering team of the Jacksonville Coalition for Equality and a steering member of the Northeast Florida LGBT Community Fund. On a more personal note, Tricia grew up in the Midwest, has been married for 37 years, is a parent of four adult children, and an avid runner and cyclist, currently ranked number one in the nation in her 10-year age group for Category 5 Criterion Racing. Wow. She transitioned from Patrick to Tricia on the job in 2012 with the full and continuing support of Bank of America. Please join me in welcoming to our service today, Ms. Tricia Russell. Well, good morning. It's really nice to be here, or I should say, it's really nice to be here again. Um, I had the privilege of being a guest homilist during your 2016 summer series, and also had the opportunity to um, see you and speak with you briefly in January of last year, so it's, it's very nice to be back. I'd like to also reintroduce to you someone else who's been here with me, and that's my wife, Katie. Um, and I really appreciate her coming with me to spend time with you today. So please welcome Katie also. I love the theme of this year's summer series, Won't You Be My Neighbor? As you know, today's sermon is titled Being a Good Neighbor to the Transgender Community. To be clear, I am transgender. Also, to be clear, my wife, Katie, is not transgender. <laughs> However, she is inextricably and inescapably linked to the transgender community through her relationship with me, whether she likes it or not. <laughs> Today, I'd like to speak about both of our journeys in hopes that it will bring additional insight for all of you regarding the broader transgender community as well as the broader community of family members of transgender, um, of the transgender community, especially spouses and children of trans people that come out and or transition in adulthood, as was the case for me, Katie, and our four children. Have no fear, there is no specific call to action that I plan to leave you with today. My hope is simply to provide new insight in an important area. I believe that misunderstanding is the root cause of most struggles in human relations. We humans tend to fear and seek to avoid or even strike out against that which we do not understand. Conversely, I believe that understanding is the first step toward acceptance and respectful treatment of those around us. But that requires an openness to learning about those that are different from us, which is no small task. So often we think we know more than we do and assume as true much that is, in fact, just that, assumption. So let's talk about what it means to be transgender. It is not a lifestyle or a lifestyle choice. I believe that I was always transgender and I always will be transgender. The real question is whether or not I am able to hide 
from others the fact that I identify as female, even though I was born with a male body. What do I mean by identify as female? It means much more than feeling more comfortable in female clothing than male clothing. And it means much more than feeling misplaced in a male body, although both of those things are true. It, is, it, it extends much further to feeling far more in rhythm in most things with most women rather than with most men to communicating and being communicated to, as well as socializing in ways more typically associated with women than with men. It was always that way for me. Even as a child, I preferred and felt more comfortable, more me, hanging out with other girls rather than boys and doing the kinds of things more typical of girls than boys. It extends also to feeling uncomfortable and inauthentic in exhibiting more typically behavior, more typically thought of as masculine, while conversely feeling much more comfortable and authentic exhibiting behavior more typically categorized as feminine or female. I feel more whole, more capable, more energized, and more connected to the people and world around me when expressing myself as female than in attempting to express myself as male. In a sense, I feel able to breathe when expressing myself as female, and conversely, as though I am gasping for air and slowly suffocating when I attempt to fit into the guy box Moreover, this is not something I can choose to turn off. When I was very young, I experienced several frightening, humiliating, demoralizing, and traumatic interactions with both of my parents, who made it very clear to me they believed there was something deeply wrong with me, and that thinking of myself as a girl or wanting to be a girl was deeply insulting to my God who created me. I deeply internalized this and both assumed it as true and set about changing myself to be like other boys, to fit proudly into the boy box. From that time forward, all the way into my mid-50s, that was a central theme of my life that affected all other aspects of my life. I prayed endlessly that God would heal me, fix me, make me like other young boys, then as I got older, like other teenage boys, that God would make me like other young men than other adult men. But try as I might, I could not change me. I only became more depressed, more withdrawn, more self-conscious, more lonely, more hopeless. I felt like a failure. I felt dirty, selfish, and unchristian. I felt broken and worthless. I believed that if I couldn't change, it must be because I wasn't trying hard enough and not praying hard enough. I made new promises and redoubled my efforts and prayers, and it did not change anything except resulting in my feeling even more of failure, bordering on self-loathing. I went through endless cycles of this, sinking a bit deeper after each one. Later, I even began to vow to punish myself in a variety of ways. If I failed to keep my promises to God to change, when I couldn't actually punish myself in the ways I had committed to do so, I felt still more a failure. This continued for decades before a shift in my thinking finally occurred. I kept coming back to something my mom had said to me as a child in our very first confrontation over gender identity. 
that God doesn't make mistakes. Ultimately, I came to believe that perhaps my mom was right, that God doesn't make mistakes. I just came to believe it in a different way than she meant it. I came to believe that per perhaps God really did make me just as I am, and that God loves me just as I am, and that I am called to be authentic. My daily prayer transitioned from asking God to change me and fix me to asking God to help me find my place in the world and to fully realize his plan for my life. Am I right or wrong for feeling as I do? I don't really know the answer to that question or whether the ans that answer is even knowable in this lifetime. But I do believe I am striving each day to be my best self. And I believe that whether right or wrong in my convictions, that I nevertheless, nevertheless deserve to be treated with dignity, love, and respect, and equal rights under the law of the land. In ways other than my transgender identity, I think I'm pretty much the same as most other people you will meet in your daily walk sharing similar dreams and striving to achieve similar goals in my life. I believe that we should choose to see Christ in one another and treat each other accordingly and leave the judging to our Lord and God in heaven. I'd like to shift gears now though and talk about Katie's journey. Through our lives together, through our courtship in the first 30 years of our marriage prior to my coming out versus the seven years of our marriage since my coming out. We met in undergraduate school, a small liberal arts college in Michigan, and we hit it off immediately, frequently crossing paths. By coincidence, it was a small school. Until I learned that she worked at the school library which I had never been in until I found out <laughs> she worked there. <laughs> and so I began to frequent the library <laughs> and I always needed a lot of assistance. <laughs> really just a pretense to see Katie. I was smitten, but she was already dating and I respected that. However, when that relationship ended nearly a year later, we crossed paths again, coincidentally, at a school dance, a chance meeting that marked the beginning of our courtship. Fast forward two years later, we were married. Fast forward five more years, and the first of our four children was born. We were inseparable. both lovers and best friends. I did and I do adore her. We were both the fourth of six children, both faithful Catholics, sharing similar interests and beliefs, sharing a zest for life, open and transparent partners in all things, except the knowledge of my female gender identity. Such dreams we evolved, especially dreams of how we would spend our time and all the things we would do and places we would go. Once the kids were grown and out on their own and we were on our own once again. However, as that time in our lives finally approached, I was sadly also reaching the end of my rope in my struggle to continue to bury and overcome my female gender identity, to change myself. It was affecting every aspect of my life and becoming increasingly debilitating. I simply couldn't hold it in anymore. My coming out and my stated intention to transition when I did so was devastating for Katie. 
So many emotions flooded forward for her, including a sense of betrayal for my not sharing this with her before we were married, a sense of complete loss, isolation, anger, feeling of helplessness and hopelessness. All her dreams of our golden years were dashed to pieces. For Katie, it was as though her husband had died, but without the closure of a funeral. I think Katie would tell you now that she finds herself in a place in life she could never have imagined, even a few years ago, in a place she certainly wouldn't have chosen had she been able to imagine it. She continues to pray for a miracle, her miracle, that things can go back to the way they once had been. She cannot help but feel abandoned by me and question the depth of my love for her. She struggles to connect me and feminine pronouns such as she, her, hers in the same sentence or thought. And yet she has remained by my side as her life has been turned upside down and her dreams unraveled. Unlike the vast majority of spouses of adult transitioners who are soon gone. Her struggles are similar to those of most spouses of adult transitioners. Are Katie and so many others in her shoes wrong to feel and struggle as they do? Certainly not. In truth, I can hardly begin to imagine the depth of Katie's understandable, inappropriate despair. She is the most kind, generous, caring, and loving person I know. I believe she deserves understanding, respect, empathy, and assistance in her time of need. And yet, in the great national focus and debate these days on all things transgender, the needs and struggles of the loved ones of our transgender brothers and sisters are so often invisible, forgotten, or greatly underestimated. Further still, even in the efforts of good and well-meaning people to treat their transgender brothers and sisters with respect and acceptance, the corollary can sometimes be a lack of empathy, conscious dis diminishment, or even outright criticism for the struggle, struggles of confused and grief-stricken family members of transgender people. So while there is still a long road ahead for understanding, respect, dignity, and acceptance for our transgender brothers and sisters, I believe there is an equally long road ahead for understanding, respect, and empathy for the struggles of their loved ones whose lives have been upended in the normal course of transition of the transgender people in their lives. My name is Tricia and I am transgender. Won't you be my neighbor? <laughs> my wife's name is Katie. <laughs> and while she is not transgender, her life has been forever changed by the journey of her transgender spouse. Won't you also be her neighbor? <laughs> Likewise, all those both like me and like Katie, won't you be their neighbors? I'd like to close today with a poem. This is titled, We Are. I am, you are, no qualifiers required. That is all you need to know, to know that we both matter. Each human life is as precious as all of human life. Independent of age, gender, race, or ethnicity, irrespective of religious views or lack thereof, independent of sexual orientation, gender identity, or expression, irrespective of socioeconomic background, independent of ableness, irrespective of political views, position, or power, independent of worldliness or education. 
yet too I most fully am only if we are. What is a life lived alone and without connectedness? But I cannot be connected without you. I love that you are different from me and me from you. Together, all of us, we are complete and beautiful. <laughs> we are the puzzle solved. To be connected, I must see you. And to see you, I must know you. To know you, I must be open and vulnerable with you and you with me. I cannot assume. We are all different. We are all diverse. Check your assumptions at the door. I will reveal myself to you. Will you to me? I yearn for that. I seek you. Together, I can be fully me, and you can be fully you. <laughs> Thank you.